Here's the book. Hi, I'm Becky. I'm an alcoholic. Um, I am super, super pumped to hear Jill speak. Um, Jill is a friend of mine who I met in San Diego. I uh, was about four months into sobriety when I went home and um, met Jill at the clubhouse there. And um, every meeting, she had something amazing that I took with me. So, um, Jill, I can't wait to hear your story. The floor is yours. All right. Thank you so much, Becky. First of all, my name is Jill and I'm an alcoholic. And I want to, con I always consider it an honor and a pleasure to be able to share my experience, strength, and hope. So I'm going to ask that all, I'm a PE teacher, so I'm going to ask that all you guys participate in this little warm-up. I'm going to get your body moving a lot because I see you guys, or a lot of you guys are sitting in your couches. So I want to get the blood flowing so you could get the brain, oxygen in the brain, you could hear what's going on. So I'm going to sing a little song. And when I sing a word that starts with the letter B, I would like you to stand up if you're sit stand sitting down. And if I sing the word again, you're going to sit down. So whenever I sing a word that starts with the letter B, let's go. So let's see how good you guys are. My Bonnie lies over the ocean. My Bonnie lies over the sea. My Bonnie lies over the ocean. So bring back my Bonnie to me. Bring back, bring back. Bring back my bunny to me. Bring back, bring back, bring back my bunny to me. Okay, excellent job. Give yourself a hand. Give yourself a hand. Thank awesome you. job. Get the blood flowing there, ready to go. Anyway, like I said earlier, my name is Jill and I'm an alcoholic. And I was born in Cleveland, Ohio, September 29th, 1966. And the very first thing my father said to my mother when I was born was, you got your girl, but she's a cripple. I was born with a club foot. And I think from the very first time I took a, drink, uh, I took a breath, I felt like there was something wrong with me. I was raised with four brothers, one adopted brother and three real brothers. And we moved to an 87 acre farm up outside of Bowling Green called Pemberville. So I grew up with horses and cows and pigs and dogs and sheep and all that stuff. But having four brothers, it was always, go home, you're a girl, we don't want you. So I would follow so far behind, catch them doing something they weren't supposed to do and say, ooh, I'm going to tell mom. They're like, okay, okay, you can come and hang out with us. But it was really confusing because I had four brothers. Whenever I play games, if I was on, of course, there's two brothers on one team, two brothers on another team, say for football. And if I went to catch a ball and I dropped it, I'd get kicked and say, man, you stink. I can't believe you dropped that. It hit your hands. You're supposed to catch it. And then if I tackled my other brother who was on the other team, he'd go, oh, don't you ever show me up in front of my friends. So eventually I just stopped playing and animals became my safe haven. They were the love of my first, my first love of life. And in fourth grade, I got in a fight with my best friend over a stupid softball game. And because I was not popular, I was the second most popular. She was the most popular. I was a little hefty, not, you know, I didn't wear the regular and I didn't wear the slim clothes. I wore the Husky clothes. So for three months in fourth grade, I would have people go fatty, fatty, two by four, can't get through the bathroom door. And they call me the Goodyear blimp. Kids can be really mean to each other. You hear the expression of sticks and stones will break your bones, but names will never hurt you. That's the biggest lie there is. Words hurt, but words can also heal. So it was interesting. My fourth grade teacher was there for me. And till this day, I'm friends with my fourth grade teacher on Facebook, which is kind of cool. So something really good came out of it. And at the age of seven, I was sexually abused by a friend of my older brother, and I thought for sure I was going to hell at seven years old. In fact, every Sunday, like clockwork, we'd go to church. You know, we had to drive 10 miles to the nearest Catholic um, church, and on the way there, we would argue and fight and yell and everything. As soon as we got out of the car, hey, how's it going? All good. Life's good. Yeah. And then as soon as we left church and went all the way home, We'd argue and fight the whole way home. So I thought, why? 
this this church thing it doesn't make sense that we're only nice to each other in public so i had a lot of mixed messages about religion and having a what's it all about and actually in 1978 there was a blizzard in up north and my mom said that's it we're moving to florida so the blizzard of 78 took my family down to florida so here i go from a an 87 acre farm with horses cows pigs dog sheep you name it to a house on a canal with alligators in my backyard so it was really really much culture shock in fact it was to the point where because i was such a tomboy and i'm still a tomboy boy to this day but i looked more like a boy back then and i would say hi my name is jill and i go i'm a girl not a boy because they would go did she say jill joe whatever um and my father was a football coach and i went to watch him play in one time and i said dad i can help you i can play for your team so i was actually the first girl in the state of florida to play regular Pop Warner football with the helmet and the shoulder pads and everything. And back then, that's when I got the nickname for JJ, Jill the Jock. Actually, my sixth grade teacher gave me that nickname. So I was playing football because in the back of my mind, when I was, you know, family vacations and stuff like family get togethers, I had an aunt who told me, you know, you're gonna be fat just like the rest of us shanks. And the same aunt said, oh, you know, your father never wanted a girl. And so even though these things were not necessarily true, I embrace them to be true. What I've realized is sometimes we act the way we think people think of us, not the reality of what they really are thinking about us. So I had this idea that I'm going to make my father proud of me. I'm going to play football. And so in high school, you know, I got 14 varsity letters in high school. I didn't even, you know, I was the goody two shoes. Didn't drink, didn't smoke, didn't do anything, you know, because I was too busy playing sports. And when I was 15 years old, my parents were going out of town, so I thought, I'm going to invite my friends, because all my friends were older, juniors and seniors, because I played on varsity sports. So I said, I'm going to drink. So we started off with big, big cups of uh, seven and seven. And I was like, I cannot understand how this liquid is going to affect my brain. Well, I came to the next morning. I said, who threw up in my bed? How did I get these clothes on? And I asked if a friend stopped by. Well, you were so full of throw up. We had to throw you in the shower. You threw up in your bed. And I swore I would never drink again. And then, because for three days, I had really bad bed spins. Ceiling fans were moving. I swore I'd never drink again. About six months later, I was introduced to beer. I did not like the taste of it but I like what it did to me. When I drank beer, I got taller, my boobs got bigger, my moves got better, and I had it going on. And let me tell you something, it did something for me. It made me feel like I fit in wherever I was. See, growing up in my family with four brothers, it was always, go home, you're a girl, we don't want you. I never felt like I belonged in my own family. And then, in all of our city sports, it was like I never hung out with people in my same grade. It was always older. And so I never felt like I belonged anywhere I went, and even on the boy, a football team. I always had to go in the girls' restroom to change, and the whole team would go somewhere else. So I created this pattern of in my mind of not belonging anywhere I went. And so from the age of 15 to 24, I got on a very self-destructive path. Yeah, I had some fun, good time drinking, but ultimately, I picked up an eating disorder also. So I would drink, get drunk, overeat on food, and then throw up and do the same thing over again. And from 15 to 24, that was my pattern. That's what I did. And I went to college on five different athletic scholarships. I drank them all away. And in fact, 1983, I knew I had a problem the very first time I drank alcohol. And there was a lady who was an aerobics instructor and she knew I had a problem with alcohol and invited me to my first meeting in 1983. I was 16 years old. My sobriety date is February 5th, 1994. Now, let me tell you something. I would get a year, go back out two and a half years, twice, but it took me a whole year, one whole year to stay sober on a Friday night. I don't know what it was. It was my mental block that I had to drink because I was young and it's Friday night and you know, back then, they, I wanted a drink at 10, 10.30 in the evening 
So I started a meeting in Winter Park, Florida at 10.30 in the evening to get through that, that first Friday night. And I remember I stayed sober on a Friday night. I went, man, if I could stay sober on a Friday night, I could stay sober on a Saturday night. And I already got the Sunday through Friday, so that's good. Because I didn't really grasp the concept of one day at a time yet. All I thought was the worst thing that could happen to me was being an alcoholic. And I hated the fact, in fact, the very first time I went to a meeting for a whole year, I would say I'm an alcoholic and I would just cry the whole entire meeting. And I realized that back then I thought being an alcoholic was my biggest curse. Today, it is my biggest blessing. In fact, if they had cheerleaders for AA, I'd be trying out and I'd be one of the cheerleaders. Because let me tell you, this is the last house on the block, but it's the best house on the block. In fact, this is the one fellowship that nobody who came here in the beginning ever wanted to be there. Nobody came in and said, yes, I'm an alcoholic. I'm so grateful to be here. No, I'm sorry. I hated the fact that I was an alcoholic. But today, I realize it is my biggest blessing. So anyway, you know, I finally somehow, some way, after getting kicked out of a small college in North Carolina, University of Tampa, I, I eventually did get my... Uh, my bachelor's degree at University of Central Florida but it seemed like my junior year in colleges I always had a hard time it seemed like I'd like to drink get drunk try and commit suicide go for an ambulance ride end up in a detox unit and then go to another treatment center I love treatment centers I it's all about me it's like how are you feeling today oh good it's all about me and now it's like I want to watch my drama on TV I don't want to create it anymore in my life I'm a high school PE teacher. I deal with enough drama as it is there in high school. So anyway, in when I was in 1991, I was 24 years old. My father said, why don't you go try out for this team, this, this game show? And I went, what game show? I was so busy being a substitute teacher and waitressing at Red Lobster and just going to meetings and fig, trying to figure out what I was doing with my life. That's what we do when we're in our early, mid-20s, even 30s, even 40s. I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up, but I enjoy, I am enjoying the journey. So anyway, my dad told me to go try out for this team called American Gladiators. And I went, tried out in January, went through the whole tryouts. They said, we'll call you. Well, January, February, March, April, May. May, hey, look at May. It's May this month, too. May, I'm, what, I'm sub, actually, I'm a waitress at Red Lobster. I'm doing the lunch shift and they say, hey, Jill, you have a phone call. And I went, what? I, nobody calls me at work. What's going on? Pick up the phone. Yeah, this is Jill Shank. He goes, this is, yes, this is Jill Shank. This is Larry Zonka. Pack your bags. We're flying you to California. I'm like, oh, I'm going to California. See, because growing up in Ohio and Florida, my idea of California was that it was going to have an earthquake and fall into the ocean. And I remember as a kid watching Chips, you know, the California Highway Patrol, I going, I want to be there someday. And the funny thing is I've actually driven and ridden, rode my bike up and down that coast. And anyway, I came out here, but as I was getting on that plane, I made a decision. I said, I'm either going to come out to California and get clean and sober for the last time, or I'm going back in a body bag. There was no in between. It was the all or nothing. So... Needless to say, I decided to get clean and sober and stay and work the steps. And so I realized I got into meetings. I, I, my father said, you don't want to be a teacher. There's no money in teaching. I came out here, got my teaching credential, was teaching at a Our Lady of Malibu, taught a lot of movie stars. Kids was so starstruck and everything like that. And, you know, I drank away all these athletic scholarships. But in 1997, I had the opportunity to play women's professional baseball for the San Jose Spitfire. And in 2000, I played profession, women's professional football for the San Diego Sunfire. I guess I'm a fireball or something like that. But anyway, I got to do these things. And here's the interesting thing. As much as I love all these outside accomplishments, see, I'm an alcoholic to the nth degree. My drug or drink of choice is more. I want more. More, I don't care if it's more alcohol, more drugs, more food, more degrees on the wall, more cats, more dogs. I like more. And in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, I've learned about balance. And balance is the key. And I've also learned that the cliff notes of Alcoholics Anonymous is 
Don't drink, go to meetings, get a sponsor, work the steps, call three alcoholics every day. That's what I need to do. I need to trust God, clean house, work with others. That's the simplicity of the program. So anyway, it, I moved down to San Diego in 1996 for a relationship and a job and both fell through. I'm here to tell you that it is possible to get through a broken heart, to get through a loss of job, to get through the death of loved ones sober. In fact, it works so much better sober. There's nothing that we can't go through together. The most important word of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is the first word of the first step. We. We can do what I cannot do alone. This is a we program, not a me program. But it's really, really tricky because in the beginning, yes, it is a selfish program. But when I learn how to do this, when I learn how to work the steps, the only step I need to do 100% is the first step. That's it. First step. That means if I have gone, I need to take the longest journey that is from my head, knowing I'm an alcoholic, to my heart, knowing I'm an alcoholic. And that journey from my head to my heart was a very painful journey. And I need to go through all the emotions that go along through acceptance. I need, at first I was in denial. I didn't want to believe it. Then I had to go through anger. I was pissed off. How can I be an alcoholic? Then I had to go through bargaining. Oh God, if you just let me be able to drink once in a while, let me be able to drink. No. And then I had to go through the sadness and the grieving part. And then finally was the acceptance. I had to, I had to surrender the idea of what my life was supposed to be with a drink in my hand. And let me tell you something. I realized in this program that I can give up one thing, that's alcohol, and have everything. Or if I choose alcohol, I lose everything. So the, it's real simple. You know what? I just stay away from the first drink. The first drink gets me drunk. I argued for eight years with my sponsor when I kept on relapse and say, no, it is the 14th beer that gets me drunk. It is not the first. And then I had one of those aha moments. Maybe I'm blonde, maybe I'm Polish. It takes me a little while to get there. But I realized if I don't pick up the first drink, I'm not gonna have the 14th drink. So I've learned in this program, we are giving 24 hours a day. And I'm gonna teach you the way it's, it's supposed to be broken up. Eight hours of work, eight hours to do stuff around the house, laundry, go grocery shopping, prayer, meditation, working out. And then the last eight hours is to go to sleep to get over the previous 16 hours so we can wake up and do it all over again. Okay. And then here's the, here's the interesting thing. Attitude is everything. And what is attitude? Attitude is my thought life turned outward. So if you have a bad attitude, look, look at your thinking. Do we have the power to change our thoughts? Yes, but not the first thought. The first thought is always the negative, destructive disease thought. It's our alcoholism going, oh, you can have one drink. <laughs> just one, it's not gonna hurt you. No, just shut up, I listened to you long enough, I'm not gonna listen to you anymore. You know what? Am I hungry, angry, lonely, tired? Most of the time I relapsed, I was hungry. In fact, I knew if it was a Friday night and I was planning on drinking, I wouldn't eat all day so I could feel the effect of alcohol. I ultimately drank alcohol because I liked the way it made me feel. Period. End of story. People say, oh, I like the way it tastes. That's nice. I like the way Diet Mountain Dew tastes. But I have never in my life sat down and drank 24 Diet Mountain Dews. 24 beers? Not a problem. But... I drank it because I liked the way it made me feel. And the interesting thing is every time I relapsed, I was hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, or one or all of those. So I'm going to teach you a few things that if I wish I could, if I could, if I could unzip you and put all the stuff that I've learned in the program since my sobriety date, February 5th, 1994, that I have learned on this journey, a journey and it's slow sobriety. It's a slow process. Remember, fast and fragile, slow and solid. So if we get things slowly, we'll appreciate them more. I can honestly say that if I, that if I had the life I have today when I was one year sober, I wouldn't have been able to, 
to handle it and I would have drank everything away. We are giving blessings as we're ready to handle them. And so I want to just teach you about the morning and nightly news, AM news and PM. AM, Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. For my students, I tell them an ambitious mindset. News, nutrition. I need to make sure I'm eating. Most alcoholics I know were hypoglycemic. We need to eat like every three hours. That's what I'm seeing for most of the people I work with. E, exercise, move your body. The best thing you could do to move your body is walking. That's it, go for a walk. Go for a walk with somebody that you that's in the program. You could have a walking meeting. In fact, now I do walking step work. Rather than sitting down in a coffee shop, I said, let's go for a walk and talk about this. W, water. Make sure you're drinking half your body weight in ounces a day. And S, sleep. Most importantly, sleep. A minimum of eight hours. That is what I've realized. And the PM? Prayer meditation. I need to pray to a God of my own understanding. And the whole purpose of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is to create a relationship with a higher power. It's not a religion. Religion is man-made. Spirituality is God-given. Religion causes the world to have wars. Spirituality causes the world to hold hands. It's not a religion, it's a relationship with my God, my higher power. And if you have an issue with God, G-O-D, I'm sure you've heard this in the rooms. Good orderly direction, good old dad, group of drunks, gratitude or death, gift of desperation, and if none of those work for you, just do dog backwards. Most unconditionally loving animal we have for us that loves us all the time just the way we are. And that's the cool thing about my higher power today. He loves me just the way I am, you know, flaws and all. And this whole, whole process of being okay and learning to love myself, that's huge. When I first got to these rooms, I looked in the mirror and I say, F you, I wish you were dead. Because I didn't like myself at all. In fact, today I look in the mirror and I see my best friend. Excuse me, I need a drink of water. <coughs> wrong too. Let's see if I can get back. Hold on. <laughs> Give me a second. God. <clears throat> Woo. I'm so grateful. So grateful to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. You have no idea how many times I tried to commit suicide. How many times I wish I was dead, how many times I took ambulance rides and would come to an emergency room going, I can't even kill myself right. I am such a loser. God, you have something for me. What do you want me to do? And he goes, love yourself. Learn to love yourself. And until you learn to love yourself, go help somebody else solve their problem. If you don't know what to do about your problem, put your problem on the back burner and go help somebody else solve their problem. That's the way this works. When I don't know what to do, I go out there and I say, God, use me. Show me, lead me, guide me. Let me be of service. Let my voice work today. I don't know what's going on. <clears throat> it's dry here, so I apologize for that. But I'm very passionate about this program. I realize that we can wake up every day and we have a choice. Am I going to be, here we go, am I going to be an Eeyore? Oh man, life sucks. Why am, I, why am I an alcoholic? Why am I gonna be a tigger? I am sober today. I am grateful today. I can walk, I can hear, I can think, I can feel. I can do all these things. I need to have an attitude of gratitude. That means I need to say thank you. I, have see, I can see, I can hear, I can feel, I can walk, I can talk. God is so good. If you're hearing me speak today, God has such an amazing plan for you. Such an amazing plan. He has great dreams that he wants you to manifest in your life. But it starts by learning to love yourself. And if you have a hard time loving who you are, find a picture of yourself when you were three years old and love that little boy or love that little girl and realize that all she's wanted your whole entire life is for you to love her or him. It's not simple. I mean, it's an easy program and it's simple, but you know what? We have to do the footwork. We have to suit up and show up. We have to go to meetings, pick up the phone, do the step work. 
Go, you can sit in a garage all you want, but that doesn't make you a car. You could sit in AA meetings all day long, but that's not going to get you sober. This is a non-drinking program, yes, but when I work the steps, it's a life-changing program. When I work the steps, I am no longer the person I used to be who used to like to drink, get drunk, go for ambulance rides and end up in emergency rooms and go to treatment centers. I am someone that can help young adults, young college students, young high school students become the best version of themselves and realize that they were born for a purpose. Okay, you know what? Alco Alcoholics Anonymous is everywhere. I've been to 28 countries and all seven continents because of Alcoholics Anonymous. Everywhere I go, I walk into a 12-step meeting, I have immediate friends. It is the coolest sorority, fraternity, whatever you want to call it, that's sobriety. So if you know about this program, consider yourself blessed. We are God's chosen people. I really believe that if everything worked like Alcoholics Anonymous, this world would be unbelievable. And you know, this thing, you know, I've gotten, you know, I got my master's degree. I've been a massage therapist. I've, I've done all these things, but I tell you what pleases my heart the most is when I take somebody through the steps and they, the light turns on, they realize that they don't ever have to drink one day at a time, one day at a time. That's all we have. Yesterday's history, tomorrow is a mystery, today is a gift. That's why we call it the present. And I'm sure you've heard this before. If you have one foot in tomorrow and one foot in yesterday, you're pissing all over yourself. And, you know, you're ruining the now. And just to share with you some things that I've gone through in my sobriety is I was 14 years sober. I thought I was going to retire because I was only teaching at a school um, about a mile and a half from where I live. In other words, I got excess as a teacher. I was so devastated. I actually went to the counseling office just to cry and vent some feelings. Do not hear me. Hear me loudly. Do not share your thoughts with a normie. They do not get us. So I went to the counseling office, shared my emotions, cried, got it out, realized that's what I needed to do is cry so I didn't go across the street and get a, a case of beer. As I'm going back to my office to finish teaching for the day, there's two police officers waiting for me. So they said, we're going to take you somewhere, young lady. You know what? Because you're a threat to yourself. I said, look, thank God somebody was married to an alcoholic and they knew what was going on. I said, look, let me go in your car. There's an AA meeting right down the street at 1230. So here I am, 14 years sober, getting escorted to an AA meeting in the back of a police car. Hey, so if you want what I have, you know, no, anyway, but it's like, I went through that. That's okay. I went through that sober and I, God gave me a job that was even better. In fact, I got a job teaching. I went through four different interviews. No, 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 no. Then I got a job. And I got hired at San Diego High School. And I was broken hearted from my other, losing my other job. But I said, I'm going to make the most of it. San Diego High School is in the epicenter of a San Diego City College. So at the age of 42, I took 12 units. And I went back to college just to play college soccer. So I would teach full time. And then I go across the street, have practices and games. And I played college soccer at the age of 42. So see, we're never, never too old to start manifesting our dreams. In fact, one time I was, took a big trip. One of my biggest trip was to Australia. I was 30 years old and I realized I wanted to start going to the continents and checking it off as my bucket list. And so I went there with a singles group. Okay. They made drinking all look really fun again. And so here I was. And for the longest time, if you're having a hard time staying sober, remember, stay sober today. If you want to drink, drink tomorrow. But then get up and do it again. Stay sober today. If you want to drink, drink tomorrow. So here's the thing. I'm in Australia. I'm with the tour group. And what happens is I'm sitting there thinking I need a meeting. And the only thing on this island is the restaurant where everybody's drinking and where we're sleeping. No meeting. So I'm praying to God. I said, God, I really want to drink but I really want to stay sober too. So I was like on the cusp 
If 50% of us wants to drink and 50% of us wants to stay sober, throw up the prayer. God will send a, an angel. That angel may have fur on, feathers on, scales on, or skin on occasionally. So here I am hiking down this path on Fraser Island in Australia. And there's this guy coming towards me. And he has the AA triangle. And that's why I always wear this necklace. And I said, are you a friend of Bill's? He goes, yes, I am. I said, I need a meeting. And he goes, meet me tonight at the restaurant and we'll have a meeting. See, that's how God works. If, like I said, we throw up that prayer, God's going to send somebody. In fact, one time on that same trip, because they were still making drinking look fun, I'm kayaking and I'm just going, God, are you even there or is this just a joke? If you're there, can you just kind of let me know that you even hear me? And a big manta ray with like a five foot wingspan jumped right by me in the kayak. In fact, I was like, okay, I got it. Thank you. And I just went, thank you for sending a manta ray and not a great white shark. <laughs> Speaking of great white sharks, one of the results of working the program is I actually went cave diving with great white sharks off of the coast of Mexico. And that was phenomenal. See, we could get, do all these things. All these things, all these dreams can come true for you. But see, attitude is everything. Really is everything. In fact, 85% of life is the Monday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, up, oh, Monday, go to work, Tuesday, you know, and then January, February, February it, it, it repeats itself, okay? But here's the thing, here's the key. If I can learn to be just as excited about going to work as I am about going on vacation or going to a party, that's the key. See, I get to do the laundry because I have clothes to wash. I get to wash the dishes because I have dishes to wash. I get to go to work because I have a job that I love and enjoy. See, when I change the way I look at things, the things I look at change. Let me say that again. When I change the way I look at things, the things I look at change. That means I need to look for the positive in everything. What we think about, we create. I didn't learn this until I was in my mid-30s. I couldn't understand while it took me the longest time to get sober. And somebody told me the subconscious brain does not understand negatives. So when I kept on saying, I don't want to drink, I don't want to drink, I don't want to drink, I was telling myself I want to drink because I was thinking about drinking. So instead, I choose to stay sober. I choose to make healthy choices for myself. I need to focus on what I want in my life, not what I don't want in my life. Whatever I think about, I'm going to create in my life. If you're afraid something's going to happen, I have news for you. If you're afraid you're going to relapse, most likely going to relapse. But if you're really busy getting out of yourself, helping somebody else, working the steps, doing what you can to be of service, you're going to stay sober. See, in the beginning, this is all about, you know, learning how to stay sober one day at a time. The only diff, you know, alcoholics have a 24 hour shelf life. That's it. I cannot stay sober on yesterday's meetings. Just like I cannot stay, you say, oh yeah, I, I ate last week. I still average three meetings a week. That just seems to work for me. Three meetings a week, three times a week seems to work for everything in my life. Meaning three times cardio, three times strength training, three times minimum. These are all minimum of journaling three times minimum of AA meetings, just three seems to be good. Because what I've noticed in the past is when I go down to two, it's really easy to go to one and then go, oh, I really don't need those meetings anymore. I'm good. I'm good. No. In order for me to keep it, I need to give it away. And so the simplicity of the steps is this. Step one, I'm powerless over alcohol. Okay. Step two, you know what? I had to admit that I was insane. I'm, I'm not insane, but see, here's the definition of sanity. Sanity is wholeness of mind. So that means if I have a pie and one piece of the pie is missing, that piece of pie is no longer sane because it's missing a piece. So we come to meetings because we're really not all here. <laughs> but anyway, we come here to get the sanity, to get in touch with our higher power. And then the third step, you know, we turn our life and our will over the care of God. Our life is our actions. Our will is our thinking. So that's, wait a second, our life is my actions. So that means I am not in the results business. God is. If I want to, something to happen, I, if I want a job, I'm not just going to sit at home and somebody's going to call me. 
I need to do the footwork. I need to go out and send out resumes. I, I resumes. I need to go knock on doors to get a job. And then God will open the right door for me to go on. I highly recommend a God box. I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but, or you can have a God box and a blessing box, whatever. One day, one, one thing a day, write a blessing, something that good that happened to you and put it in a box and put it in a box or put it in the jar or whatever you have. And at the end of the month, go over it and realize all the good things that happened to you. Focus on the good. You focus on the good, more will happen. You focus on the bad and problems, more bad and problems will happen. It's amazing the way it works. I wish I would have really comprehended this in my early sobriety. But maybe someone told me and I wasn't really ready. So the interesting thing is what I, I have to think about it. I remember I was 19 years old. I hated my dad growing up. I think most teenagers don't like their parents. but And I remember my mom said, out of all my kids, I have four brothers, one adopted, you are most like your father. And I went, what? I spent so much time not that I was thinking about him so much that I became it. That's why it's important to get a sponsor, get a mentor, somebody that has what you want. Anybody who's successful in their field is more than welcome to show you what they did to get there. Because people who are successful realize there's room at the top for everybody. All of you can be successful. The only thing that's stopping you is yourself. And let me tell you what a joy it is to look in the mirror and see your best friend and see someone that's never going to leave you. But see, for the longest time, I did geographics. I went from North Carolina to Alaska to Florida to California, everywhere I went, there I was. You can't get away from yourself. And so learn from me. For years, I used and abused myself. I was a cutter. I was a burner. I did all that stuff. Loving and approving of myself, not, not what I do. I'm talking about loving and approving of who I am and just realize that life is about making mistakes and life is about failures. I have relapsed over 3,000 times, but I've gotten sober 3,001 times. Doesn't matter how many times you fall down, get back up again. Doesn't matter. Just keep on showing up, suit up, show up. Do the next right thing, especially when you don't feel like it. I am so tired of people going, I don't feel like it. Well, excuse me. Come on. If we waited around till we felt like taking the trash out, I don't know about you. I would never take out the trash. So sometimes I'll sit there and go, okay, I'm going to time myself just to see how long it takes me to take out the trash. Because I would go, oh, I don't want to. Two minutes to go to the trash, take it outside and come back in. Just do it. Just do the next indicated thing. Just do what's in front of you, especially when you don't feel like it. You can do it. It's an action. Uh, it's an object at rest stays at rest. An object in motion stays in motion. You just got to put one foot in front of the other. That's what works for me. When I don't want to do something, I'm like, let's just do it and get it over with. I don't always want to go to meetings, but I always feel better after I go. Always. And it's amazing. You know, when I played women's professional baseball in 1997, my roommate got injured and the coach was a real big jerk and he shattered my spirit as an athlete. And I remember I had to go get the smoothie at one of these places and I'm, and I'm contemplating suicide. I'm sober, but I'm contemplating suicide because my thinking was not very healthy back then. And I'm walking to get this smoothie. I had never taught up in San Jose. I taught in Malibu. And I hear somebody say, Coach Shank. And I was like, who's this? I turn around and it was this lady with a child that her child I taught from kindergarten to second grade. And she said to me, I want to thank you because whenever anybody says, you can't do this, she stands up really tall and she goes, yes, I can. Coach Shank said I can do anything I put my mind to. Sobriety is a mindset. Decide you're going to stay sober no matter what. Experience the feelings, the pain, the sorrow that goes along with grieving the loss. But let me tell you something. Our God is a good God and he has given me back double, if not more, for all that I lost through drinking. But it did not happen overnight and it will not help happen overnight. We have to build our character first. 
you know, back to the steps. The fourth step, don't worry about the fourth step. You're only making a list of four different things. That's it. Your resentments, fears, sexual harms, harms other than sexual. That's it. Keep it short to sweet, cliff notes. You get together with somebody and you share that and you realize you're not alone. We have all been there. In fact, there's nothing that you've done that someone hasn't done after you and it's that someone hasn't done before you that is going to continue going on. I used to think I was so unique. And after hearing many fifth steps, I realized, you know what? We're all in this. I want to call it, this is a monopoly game. Someday all the pieces are going to go back in. Other people are going to drive our cars and live in our houses. We're going to go on. And thank God I, I, I have a spiritual program today. And I'm, I'm not afraid of meeting my creator face to face and giving him a hug. Let me tell you though, there's stuff that I'm meant to do here. And there's stuff that you're meant to do here. Don't give up on yourself. You are beautiful. You are loved. You are amazing. There's no other person on the planet like you. And nobody has a story like yours other than you. And see, you may be the only walking talking big book that anybody sees out there you are your own minister or, or pastor where you live you lead by example walk the walk don't just talk the talk walk the walk the hardest thing for me is yes i i love talking i'm a talker but let me tell you something my mouth got me in trouble especially my first three years of sobriety i find that most people when they get sober they share something that they shouldn't have said or say something. They're just too honest and bah. Then about three weeks later, they'll make amends for it. Then in the second year of sobriety, they'll say it and apologize right then and there. The third year of sobriety, they catch it before it comes out so they don't have to make amends for it. Okay. You know, I could be looking at someone and thinking, oh my gosh, what, you know, people can experience your energy. Okay. It's all about having an attitude of gratitude, being grateful that we live in a country. I mean, I love speaking, but I miss the energy of the crowd. I have no idea. Some of you guys may have gone back to sleep and I'm teaching, I'm teaching the no, no kids are turning on their camera. So I don't even know who I'm teaching to, but still, I just want to encourage you guys to never give up. As long as the heart's still beating and the body is still breathing, there's always hope. For things to get better suddenly your depression can be removed suddenly your dream job can come your way suddenly the cancer can be gone we have a God of miracles I don't know about you but for me to be sober on a four-day weekend getting ready to start I would be three sheets to the wind and let me tell you something God has blessed me and it's sad because I have family members that are still drinking every day they know about AA. They know about 12 steps. 12 steps are for everybody and anybody. And if you don't have an alcohol problem or drug problem, there's Al-Anon and there's ACA. There's other programs. This program has fellow this fellowship has given me a way to live. It's a design for living. And I've realized that everything happens for a reason. Sometimes we don't understand until looking back on it. And everything in my life, it's like, okay, God, I don't get it, but this is what I've learned lately. I've learned that life is full of problems. Right when you solve one, something else is going to happen. I used to have such a bad attitude and get so pissed off at things. Now I go, why well, have a bad attitude? I'll just have a good attitude until the solution comes. And it's amazing how when the more things I have come in my way, the more craziness with whether it's students or tenants or whatever that's happening to me and it just seems like boom 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 i just go okay god something good is coming my way because in order for all this to happen to me if i keep a good attitude through it all some I, there's a blessing right around the corner don't quit before the miracle but here's the here's the here's the catch 22 part you know they say in aa expectations are premeditated resentments well, as a teacher, I need to have expectations for my students, okay? And I like to have high expectations for them. But honestly, they say, watch out for expect expectations. You're going to get a resentment. And then I'm like, okay, wait a second, God. How about if I have great expectations of God? 
See, God wants to give us what I call God winks or God shots in the day. Look for them, whether it's a hummingbird flying by or just someone you haven't seen in a while. Those are God shots. You know, I want to encourage you to be the best version of yourself. And that version is a sober version. Let me tell you something. Sobriety rocks. It is so awesome. Once I've dealt with all the sexual abuse, the verbal abuse, the emotional abuse, I used to, man, I was the pity pot queen. Poor Jill, poor Jill, poor Jill, another drink. You know, that's the way I was for a long time. You wouldn't believe it, but I'm telling you, you know, for someone who got kicked out of two colleges and went through four alcoholic drug treatment centers and can't even count my suicide attempts, I'm grateful that I'm a failure at suicide attempts because if I wasn't, I wouldn't be here right now. And God is good and you are great. And if you have been introduced to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, grab a sponsor, grab a temporary sponsor, call that person every single day. Every single day, work the steps, read the big book. I'm telling you, you can have a life beyond your wildest dreams. I have seen so many people come in the rooms. Their life got good. They got the dream job. They got the dream relationship. They got married. They stopped going to meetings. They relapsed. They can't get back in. Or they end up six feet under. Here's the thing about the disease of alcoholism. The disease of alcoholism wants you and me six feet under. But if it can't put us six feet under, it wants us to be in and out of the rooms of AA, in and out of institutions, or miserable in the rooms. And I did not get clean and sober to be miserable. I got clean and sober to have a life full, abundant, overflowing. Let me tell you, this thing works. It really does just do it. And I promise you, fasten your seatbelt and get on, get ready for the ride of your life. And I'm going to end with one of my favorite quotes. I actually, it's an anonymous quote, but I've added a little bit to things that I like to it. It was like, what I was regretting the past and fearing the future. And I heard my God say to me, when you're in the past, with all its regret and shame, it is difficult. My name is not I was. And when you're in the future, with all its anxieties and fears, it's difficult. My God says, my name is not I will be. But when you're in this moment, this precious moment, it is not hard because my God says my name is I am. It's about living in the moment. The whole program of Alcoholics Anonymous is about change. The only thing that I've created is an acronym for change. Constantly having adjustments, needing God every day. Unless you don't believe in God, needing gratitude every day. A grateful person will not pick up the drink. I promise you. So I'm going to end this because the bell is about ready to ring. And I realize I it's my pet peeve when pe speakers speak longer than they're supposed to. So I'm going to end this and I'm going to ask that you do this the way I end my PE classes. I would like you to, you know, keep your, your mic microphones on mute, but repeat after me. I'm awesome. I'm awesome. I'm beautiful. I'm beautiful. I'm confident. I'm confident. I could do anything I put my mind to. I love and approve of myself. I love and approve of myself. Something good is going to happen to me today. Hey, I don't see you guys saying it. What's up with that? Come on. Anyway, I just want to say thank you, Becky, for asking me to share my story. I hope you got something from it. I love the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I want to wish you blessings, abundant blessings on your journey of this 12-step program, and know that I love you guys, okay? Take care. Peace out. I don't know how I turn it over or what. Hey! Yeah. <laughs>